Hey, it's me, Evil Tutin, and welcome to Trilby's Notes. Yes, it's Trilby, he's back. I promised you Trilby is gonna come back. And this game is big, okay? This game is a big deal. You watched five days, you've watched seven days. We've seen John Defoe, the machete killer. We've seen Dr. Jonathan Somerset, who turned out to be not Dr. Jonathan Somerset. But for those of you who didn't get it, his name is Malcolm, and he's the guy who's logging into uh, his computer terminal at the beginning of seven days. And then, of course, Trilby, who, y you know, his real name we'll never know, or maybe we're going to find out in Trilby's notes. I don't know. Um, I mean, <laughs> I have never played this game. I don't know what, what, what we're getting into. And yeah, so Trilby is back. And this game is going to introduce a overarching, huge backstory to to the Defoe Manor incident, which means that all I can say is enjoy the intro. And also note that there is a floppy disk on the table. This game was made in 2006, so keep that in mind. Are you ready to dive into some backstory? Here we go. No. No, not for this let's play. The following documents are taken from the handwritten notes of Trilby, an STP field operative, etc. Et you get the idea. <laughs> Game over. That was what I thought as I stood and watched the foe manor collapse into flaming ash. The ordeal was over. Those five days cost us all so much. Philip and AJ paid with their lives. They were the fortunate ones. Jim Fowler was expelled from school for truancy, a bright future in tatters. Simone Taylor took to the bottle. Her broadcast became slurred, her eyes hollow and unwelcoming. She soon vanished from television screens. As for me, I tried to return to life as a cat burglar, but I had been forever tainted by my time spent in that wretched house. The memories of my possession came back in my nightmares. Every night I was there again in the mansion, staring out through unfamiliar eyes as Philip died at my hands. I became convinced that John the Foe was not at rest, that someday he would return for me. I became so terrified of invisible enemies that I forgot about the tangible ones. Drill be caught. Two stone miserable years after the foe manor, a barrage of truncheon, I hope that's how you pronounce it, blows taught me a harsh lesson in reality, and I woke up in the kind of filthy cell I assumed would be my new home. But then he came, the man from the government with his nervous smile offering an alternative. The STP, the special talent project. It hadn't been that much earlier that I would have sooner died than entered an obligation with anyone, at least. Least of all the government, had the foe manor changed me so much. Whatever my reasons, I left my past behind and resolved to give my new superiors nothing to complain about. I spent a year and a half completing assignments, developing contacts, building a reputation. And then, the past caught up. In the summer of 1997, I became concerned about Simone Taylor's mental well-being. The papers were report the papers were reporting her continual breakdown, and she had become a virtual recluse. I had no idea if my appearance would assist or hinder. I had, after all, deliberately allowed her to think me dead. Presumably, she knew differently now after the media coverage of my arrest, but I would expect her to be bitter about my subterfuge. On balance, I decided that a meeting with an old friend would lo would most likely be beneficial. I came to her apartment building on a warm, stormy night and braced myself for the encounter. And here we are. And one thing you will notice immediately is that we are now playing with a text parser interface, which means that you have to type things such as "look." Simone's apartment. Let, wait, let me just adjust something. Can I... Mm, all right. Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> okay, sorry, again, look. 
Simone's apartment building was gripped by a thick smell of musty, unwashed carpets. It perplexed me that a celebrity would choose to live in such low-rent accommodation. Alright, let's knock on her door. I knocked sharply upon Simone's door. Let's knock again. Receiving no reply, I knocked again, louder. And a third time. <laughs> Still no response. The doorman had assured me Simone was in. I decided it was time to enter by my own methods. And here we go. Pick lock. Adjust the microphone. I reasoned that Simone could have been in trouble and even if she wasn't, then at worst I was only playing to my reputation. I spent a few minutes feverishly picking the lock, then let myself in. Is it feverishly? Feverishly? And here we are. Dark room. This should be a window. Looks like there's some light coming in. So maybe we can open the blinds. Ah, come on. I have the microphone right in front of me. Typing is hard, which makes the playthrough of this game especially challenging for me. <laughs> from the logistics, but I'll get it. Oh. Well, I guess... There's a body lying there. The body on the floor was on the body on the floor was undoubtedly Simone. I felt for a pulse and my hands came away stained with long cold blood, long cooled blood. My fingers traced the outline of a large wound in her torso, slashed by a big weapon wielded by a big assailant. I hope you guys know what's coming. I called for an ambulance as future as futile as it would be and left before they arrived. Due to me being a clear murder suspect, I was relieved from duty for the week it for the week it took for the Ministry of Occultism to inspect the flat and confirm supernatural activity. My superior simultaneously apologized and assigned me to investigate if there was a connection to the Defoe Manor incident. Merely reading those three words capitalized on the front of a loose leaf file brought the nightmares back with more intensity than ever. Sure enough, a field agent reported that looters had discovered and sold several artifacts from the mansion, including the wooden idol that housed John Defoe's soul. I'm just realizing that this game has such a great soundtrack and the fact that I'm reading text... Uh, you can't hear it if I do that. What should we do about it? Nothing we can do. <laughs> Unless you want to read for yourself. To my surprise, no murders had been reported or committed by anyone who had come into contact with the accursed trinket. I did not find this reassuring. I quickly advised James Fowler to go into hiding. He was stunned, but agreed. The boy had sense and still respected my judgement. This done, I began following the idol's trail. From the pawn shop it had entered the possession of one Professor Abed Chehal, eh? an authoritative historian. He had scheduled some kind of antique fair in the Clan Bronwyn Hotel. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Clan, Clan Bronville. The Clan Bronwyn. What am I? <laughs> Will. Clan Bronville Hotel. You all are invited. Clan Bronville. Bronwyn. Oh god. Hotel. On a small island off the coast of. See? I have, I have no idea. Ang Anglesey? <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys. I, I know nothing about the UK or anything British. I get <laughs> I, I don't, I, I honestly, the thing is, I, I learned English, but I learned American, I grew up learning American English, I, I, I know so little about about this, so, you know, I'd, who cares, you just, I, it's, it is what it is. Assuming the role of a scholar of antiquities, I booked a room. On the 28th of, Jul on the 28th of July, 1997, uh, note the date, I got a ferry from, oh my god. From this, what you see on screen, in Eng, you know, and arrived at around 3 p.m. in Glen Bronville, Isle, Glen Bronvin, Island's coastal village. It seemed a peaceful hamlet, and in defiance of stereotypes, the locals were welcoming and told me no local legends to disarrate me from exploring the island. The Glen Bronvin Hotel was in the island's center, surrounded by forest. I made my way there on foot. You're Trilby, right? As soon as I arrived, I was greeted by a balding man in a grey anorak. I wondered if I was expected to know who he was. That depends. My name is Lenkman, I'm with the Ministry of Occultism. Oh. 
I thought the Ministry were clear on the fact that I was handling this on my own. Maybe there are still people who don't trust you, Mr. Trilby. What? I haven't stolen anything since I joined the STP. Your colorful past is not what concerned my superiors. It hasn't gone unnoticed that your history with the Defoe Wraith influenced Wraith influence you psychologically. I'm sure you resist it, but it could still cause you to act irrationally, disobey orders. Everyone just feels a little safer with someone else on the ground. I see. You can rest assured that I will endeavor to maintain absolute professionalism on this assignment. Nevertheless, I have my orders. I would suggest we keep out of each other's way then and pursue separate investigations. I'm sure I don't want to get mixed up in a reunion. I watched him disappear around the corner of the building. I very much doubted that Lenkman and I would become friends. The Glen Bronwyn Hotel lobby was a warm welcome. The building was certainly well maintained, and yet there was something about it that nagged at the back of my mind, quickening my pulse. As soon as I press enter, you are free to, you know, be on the lookout for anything that catches your, your eye. I dismissed the sensation, an act which, in retrospect, I would come to regret. I don't see anything. Good evening, Terence Railby. I have a reservation. Ah yes, you're here for the antique fair? We've put you in room 3C on the third floor, if you'd just like to sign the check-in book. Hello, Bethan. Just letting you know I'll be having dinner in my room today. That's absolutely fine, Professor. This, I decided, was what they called a golden opportunity. Professor Chehal? Yes. I'm afraid you have me at a disadvantage. Railby, Terence Railby, we met at Sotheby's a few months ago. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Er, you, oh, you don't remember me. No, no, of course I do. Terry Railby, how you've been? How. Uh, mm -hmm. The astute reader has already guessed that both Terence Railby and the previous meeting were utter fiction. I had spent some time studying Chehal's movements and habits. He was, by all accounts, absent minded, and that was something I could use. I'm well, thanks. I was hoping I'd run into you. I've heard interesting things about the items you're showcasing here. You remember, I do freelance scouting for some wealthy collectors. Uh, yes. Well, a client of mine has expressed an interest in relics from the Faux Manor in Buckinghamshire. He's been on my back for a while about it. Between you and me, he seems pretty obsessed. What remained of Professor Chehal's suspicion melted away from his expression as the opportunity to make money entered the conversation. Well, I'm sure I wouldn't want to damage your professional status. Would you like to come up to my room for drinks? Oh, I don't want to impose. No imposition at all. Please follow me. Your room key, Mr. Railby. Thank you. Please lead the way, Professor. Professor. <laughs> So, a bet? Who's your friend? Oh, let me introduce you. This is my personal assistant, Chauvin. I hope that's how we say it. She accompanies me on most of my excursions. Chauvin, this is Mr. Railby, an old acquaintance. He's looking for information on the Faux Manor artifacts. Oh, really? Him and half the people we meet. What is it about that place? Never underestimate the attraction of a mystery, my dear. Please take a seat, Terry. I'll be right with you. She's supposed to be Irish, and I am told. So, interested in ghost stories? The girl struck me as a forceful personality. I gave the matter some thought before replying. Okay, so, uh, she's supposed to be Irish, and I'm being told that Chauvin is an old Irish name. So I, I can't really pronounce it. <laughs> I could say Siopan if you like that, but that's obviously stupid. So uh, you'll just have to excuse me while I'm going to keep saying Chauvin. <laughs> I have no idea. Not really. 
I'm just scouting on behalf of a client, like I told the professor. Hmm. You know, it's strange to see someone as young as you in the antique trade. And I'm not doing an Irish accent, because that would be embarrassing for everybody. <laughs> and come to think of it, I thought only old men dressed like that, no offense, meant. None taken. I didn't catch your last name. It's O'Malley. Siobhan O'Malley. Couldn't be more Irish if I tried, could it? Sorry to keep you waiting, dear boy. Now then, what should we talk about? Alright, and now the text parser interface comes. Okay, first of all, I'm going to save. I'm going to call it TN1. I have, I'm not creative with that. <laughs> and um, we're going to end this episode soon. Because... Yeah, we're going to do a little bit more. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've decided. The episode is going to go on a little bit longer, but after this conversation we have to end it. So, ask a bit... Uh, the foe. You, you, it, 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 uh, it's okay if you only type in keywords, so what I'm trying to type is ask a bit about the foe manner artifacts, but all you have to do with these text parser interfaces, uh, pro tip, is if you just type the keywords, most of the time it will work, so ask and then person, and then topic, and then it works. So I understand you came into possession of artifacts from the foe manor. Yes, indeed, and it was astonishing to me that such artifacts existed at all. The whole place burned to the ground. Did you hear about the foe manor incident? I was experiencing a sick feeling that I had not felt for quite some time. The last I had felt it was while standing at the gates of another country mansion, not long after the foe manor, preparing to break in. Recalling those five wretched days turned my stomach with fear, turning what once had been the joy of thievery into an exercise in anxiety. Discussing it brought that feeling back. The act of feigning ignorance while visions of welding masks and machetes flooded my mind's eye worsened then, worsened them. I, I heard something on the news. And it's been on the news again lately since that Taylor woman died. A lot of silly talk about the paranormal has been around so the true facts are near unreachable. But the point is, some enterprising fellows picked up one or two undamaged items from the ruins. Furniture, books, an ugly little tribal figurine. And I took them off their hands purely out of curiosity, of course. So, were there any particular items your client is interested in? Obviously, we're going to ask about the tribal figurine. Uh, maybe tribal works? Tell me, does a huge man in welding mask and leather apron mean anything to you? That's such an odd line of dialogue. I, I, I never got that, really. Why he, why he would say that? It's a small African figurine that my client wants me to look into. Resembling a rather ugly tribal god. And that old thing? Honestly, despite its age, it's virtually valueless. That's what I said, but my client is very insistent. He's interested in the paranormal, and the idol features in some of the more unlikely accounts of the Defoe Manor incident. Well, I don't suppose I should ask questions if this man of yours wants to take it off my hands? I don't have it on me right now, it's being kept in the hotel safe. Perhaps we can work out a deal after the fair. I had intended to display it with the other Defoe artifacts. Inwardly, I just wanted to get this mission completed as fast as possible, but I didn't want to risk a s suspicion or giving off the wrong impression. That'll be fine. So, just out of interest, what else have you picked up from the mansion? Odds and ends, basically. Some silverware and ceramics. Ceramics, most of a burnt rocking chair. And the paintings, of course. Painting. A landscape from a wall in the mansion's lounge. Of little artistic value, but the, arti but the artist features prominently in Defoe Manor's colorful history. Matthew Defoe. That's him, yes. Bethan, she runs the hotel. She asked if she could display it in the lobby. Instantly I recalled the sick feeling I had felt in the lobby. I had seen the painting, but I had paid a little heed. So I hope you saw it too, you guys. 
Oh. Are you alright, Mr. Railby? You've gone rather pale. What? I'm sorry, I was just distracted by my thoughts for a moment. Lost in history, eh? Something like that. Mr. Railby! What the hell was that? What the hell was what? You were just sitting there, then you went all stiff like you'd seen a ghost! You didn't see it. See what, Mr. Railby? I, I'm sorry, I have to go. Something's wrong. Oh, well, we won't keep you then. We'll see you later, maybe? And we're out. <laughs> my head was spinning and a sudden nausea churned my gut. The world seemed to be pulsating, the corners of the room wavering like a heat, like a heat wave haze. Oh god. Whisper, whisper. You may say I imagined this thing, these things and I thought that must have been the case. Was I going out of my mind? Was the hotel really changing into some nightmarish twin? Was I the only one who could see it? If I was hallucinating, it was too complex. The harsh wooden floor beneath my feet felt real enough. The horrendous stench of rotting flesh that reached my nostrils could not have been conjured by imagination. I decided that I had to find John Defoe's idol as soon as possible. If not that, then at least the painting Chehal had mentioned. It was con I was convinced that some connection lay between Defoe Manor and this sudden madness. Actually, it doesn't make sense that I'm reading it out with such, you know, that I put emotion into the text. Because Trilby is writing this in his journal, you know, this is something that has already happened. Uh, that's why the game is called Trilby's Notes. Trilby is sitting at his desk writing this into his journal about the incident at the hotel. Uh, but I mean, you know, obviously, I, I think it's better if, if I read it out with some emotion. Let's just pretend that these are his thoughts that he has right now. And you need to remember the staircase, uh, because this is going to come up in the next game. So what's this? The stairwell was built... yeah, okay, he's just imagining the room. Uh, there was a headless corpse slumped in the corner. Look, corpse. The body was that of a young muscular man, I hazarded and was wearing some kind of old-fashioned military uniform, complete with blue tunic and riding boots. More to the point, his head was missing and his hands were worn down to bloody wads of flesh and bone. I noticed a collection of handwritten pages on the floor near his body. Okay then, look pages. They appear to be entries from a diary. July 18th. Felicia and I took shelter from the storm in the decrepit old hotel in the forest. It seems to be completely deserted, so we bedded down on the floor of the lobby for the night. It is so peaceful here. The noise of the storm seems far away. July 19th. Exploring the hotel, it has become increasingly clear that the place is not as innocent as it first seemed. We found ancient corpses and evidence of terrible deeds in several of the rooms. The storm has cleared and we intend to leave as soon as possible. July 20th. I am certain now that devilry is at work. Every path we take through the forest brings us back to the hotel. We spend the whole day trying routes to no avail. Felicia keeps talking of a demon she fancies she saw in the hotel kitchen last night. July 21st. Felicia is dead. I was too late to help her. I saw her murderer just as she did. Perhaps I will be next. I am beginning to understand. July 23rd. The murderous figure in black, uh, the one whose body is savagely stretched into a mockery of form, is not the architect of this nightmare. Rather, this is the work of that hideous lord of the forbidden lands. Gods forgive me. July 25th. I built a shrine to my captor in the lobby in an attempt to appease it. Nothing has changed. I have no more food. The horror is starting to affect my mind. July 28th. I am certain my mind is going. I imagined for a moment that the hotel had changed, had become finely decorated and welcoming as it must have once been in the past. I, I blinked and it returned to its normal hateful self. The next few pages were sprinkled with blood, obscuring some of the text. August 1st. What is his relationship to that disgusting bee? Is he a servant or a prisoner? Sometimes he acts alone, sometimes... Behest of a high 
How I was as you want from me? August 3rd. He is after me now, I think I must have done one something wrong. August 4th. It hurts. That was the last readable entry. I decided not to take them with me. They were covered in blood and all stuck together. Ugh. <laughs> Alright then. The lobby too had been tainted and the painting I sought was absent. Presumably it only existed in the hotel's normal form. If that was the case, I needed to find a way back there or dispel the hallucination, if this truly was all in my mind. At this stage, I was beginning to wonder if this really was all John Defoe's doing. It didn't seem his style somehow, but what other evil could possibly be the culprit? What other evil indeed? Who could be the culprit? Guys, I don't know. I guess we'll just have to find out in the next episode of Trilby's Notes. I hope you're hooked, because... uh. This is going to be a riot, I promise you. So, see you then. And, no, that's all. Just, just see you next time.